Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences breakout session tonight. We're so pleased you made the time to be here. My name is Megan Hinckley and I am a member of the Dean's Office in Shass. Like you, I am looking forward to learning more about using scientific evidence to combat climate change and poverty from Claire Walsh, who I now have the pleasure of introducing. Claire is the Associate Director of Policy at JPAL Global at MIT, where she has worked since 2012. In this role, she works with policymakers and JPAL affiliated researchers around the world to share insights from randomized evaluations and to promote evidence informed policy to reduce poverty and to fight climate change. Claire is the Project Director for JPAL's King Climate Action Initiative, or KCI, which we, she will be discussing this evening. Claire previously led JPAL's Innovation in Government Initiative, a global fund to support governments in harnessing data and evidence to drive innovation and improve public policy. And she served as interim deputy director of JPAL Southeast Asia and Jakarta. In 2019, MIT awarded Claire the Excellence Award among the highest honors of the Institute for its staff. Claire holds a master's from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she specialized in development economics and international business relations, and a BA in anthropology from Vassar. Without further ado, I turn the session over to you, Claire. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. That's definitely the kindest introduction I've ever got, so thanks, Megan. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to connect with you all and uh, I'm excited to share more about our work uh, on using scientific evidence to combat climate change and poverty at JPAL. Um, I've really enjoyed being a member of the MIT community the past almost nine years now and I'm excited to share more about uh, our work and, and get the chance to have a discussion afterward as well. Um, so before I tell you about our work in climate change and poverty alleviation, let me share a little bit about JPAL. So JPAL was founded here in Shass in the economics department at MIT by professors Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo uh, back in 2003. And since then it's grown into a global network of researchers all around the world. So we have a lot of faculty here at MIT, but we also have um, affiliated researchers at top universities across the US, across Europe, Latin America, Africa, Asia. And uh, these researchers are predominantly economists, um, some political scientists, some public health researchers. And what unites them is that they use a particular research methodology called randomized evaluations uh, to measure the impact of a social program on people's lives in the real world. And this is always done in close partnership with an NGO or a government. And you'll see this map here shows dots of, of everywhere where we've partnered with a government or an NGO to do one of these evaluations. And the types of questions that this research helps answer are, did the program work? Did it actually reduce poverty? Did it improve education? Did it improve health? Um, did it reduce carbon emissions? Uh, and after we conduct this research, we also work to support governments and NGOs and using the insights from this research to improve real world programs and practice. And so in addition to doing research, we also have policy outreach teams, which is where I sit. So we form long term partnerships with governments and NGOs in the countries where we have a long term presence and support them in applying insights from research and policy so that research is actually used and improves people's lives. And then we also have education and training teams who provide online and in-person education programs so that anyone who wants to can learn how to use this methodology to measure the impact of their programs and policies or use the results from um, JPAL affiliates research to improve their programs. And we're not just based here at MIT. Um, we also have uh, permanent offices at top universities um, in across seven regions around the world. And uh, since JPAL was formed in 2003, through this large network of researchers, this large network of offices and government and NGO partners, 
To date, um, our government and NGO partners have scaled effective programs that were first evaluated by JPAL affiliated researchers to reach over 400 million people around the world. And these are uh, poverty reduction programs like cash transfers, or you might have heard of the NGO BRAC and their ultra poor graduation approach to reducing extreme poverty, um, but also health programs like school based deworming or free anti malarial bed nets and reducing uh, user fees for preventative health. Uh, services. So you might ask, why is a poverty-focused uh, research center at MIT working on climate change? And that's because uh, at JPAL, and I, I think you know many of us in this room probably recognize that climate change and poverty are two deeply interconnected global crises, and we think it's important to tackle them together. Um, climate change threatens to push an additional 100 million people around the world into poverty over the next decade alone. Already, you know, continuing the disturbing reversal we've seen um, in that global poverty is now increasing um, uh, following the COVID crisis. Um, and we also know that climate change is, uh, its impacts will be highly unfair and unequal. It will disproportionately harm um, low-income communities, communities of color, whether they be in the U.S., um, but particularly um, people living in poverty in low- and middle-income countries will um, suffer disproportionate harm as a result of climate change. Um, and that's for a couple reasons. One, um, they happen to live in places where they're more exposed to um, both pollution and the effects of climate change, so extreme weather, extreme heat, drought, floods, etc. Um, and then they also have fewer infrastructure, um, fewer financial resources, fewer services to adapt. So we think it's important to work on these uh, problems in tandem. Um, and so in 2020, uh, JPAL launched a major uh, climate action initiative called the King Climate Action Initiative, which is funded by King Philanthropies. And our mission is to innovate, test, and scale evidence-informed climate solutions that focus on solutions that can benefit people in poverty, either by greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions or by providing um, low-income communities with services that can reduce pollution, increase their energy access, or help them, help them adapt to climate change. And um, we, as I've already explained, we think it's important to um, uh, focus on what we call the four pillars of the global climate and energy challenge. So, of course, we think it's important to work on climate change mitigation, which is um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting tons out of the atmosphere as quickly and as fast as possible. But we also think it's uh, hugely important to ensure that the people who did not cause climate change and when have the fewest resources to adapt, um, get services that can help them adapt to climate change. And we also work on pressing public health issues issues like uh, conventional pollution um, that are contributing to uh, millions of early deaths around the world already. Um, so we work on mitigation, adaptation, pollution reduction, and energy access. And so um, before I open it up to q and I'll just share some examples of a couple research projects and a couple uh, scaling projects uh, uh, before heading into Q&A. So um, this first uh, study is a research project by um, Rohini Pandey and Malik Jagnani, uh, working in partnership with NGOs and a tech company in Assam and Bihar, India, where low-income communities in the Ganges Brahmaputra River Delta um, are exposed every year and increasingly because of climate change to very severe floods that displace them and destroy a lot of their housing. Um, and so what they're doing in this study is testing um, uh, doing the first large scale impact evaluation of a flood early warning system um, that will uh, provide uh, low income communities with information a lot sooner than is currently available about where floods are going to be the worst and where they can go to avoid them. And what they're doing is they're pairing this smartphone based app early warning system with community outreach by a local trusted NGO um, to see if, if this can help people evacuate sooner. Um, and if this in turn uh, helps improve uh, or helps reduce um, the negative health and income impacts of these extreme floods. So that's an example of an adaptation project. Um, now I'll give you an example of a, a mitigation project that's in partnership um, with the shipping industry. 
Uh, so this is a project that uh, Rob Metcalf is working on uh, replicating a very successful study um, in the airline industry. He partnered with a major airline to test a really um, simple and innovative innovation, which is giving airline pilots information about their fuel efficiency on their flights, um, their coworkers' efficiency on their flights, uh, and how they're performing against their peers. Uh, tips on how to uh, increase their fuel efficiency. Um, and what the study found is that um, it was a highly cost-effective way to um, reduce the airline's carbon emissions. And so they're now trying to test the same intervention to see whether it works with shipping captains. Um, and of course, it's important over time that we decarbonize the entire economy, um, but we also need to start getting um, uh, carbon emissions out of the atmosphere as soon as possible. Um, and so we're seeing whether this cost-effective intervention that worked in the airline industry might also work in the shipping industry where uh, captains have similar control over how much fuel they use on their routes. Um, the last two projects are what we call scaling projects, and that's taking the research that's already been done in the past. A government or an NGO that we work with closely uh, invites us to help them apply the research um, in their policy and practice. So in this case, um, uh, Kelsey Jack and j -Pal Africa have a long-term partnership with the city of Cape Town. And in the city of Cape Town and in all of South Africa, um, low-income households are eligible for a free basic um, amount of electricity. Um, and uh, in Cape Town, about a quarter of the city's residents are eligible for this and, and meet this low-income threshold. Um, and the challenge is that the government actually doesn't have great data on people's income levels. And so it's really hard for them to know whether they're actually reaching low-income households or not. And so what this project is going to do is going to take evidence from uh, studies that J-PAL affiliated professors have done in many countries around the world about targeting cash assistance to low-income households and um, finding creative ways to do that when you don't necessarily have data on people's incomes uh, to help the city make sure that um, this subsidy is reaching the low-income households that are entitled to it. And then the last project um, before I close is uh, one that SEMA, Santiago, and Santiago are uh, conducting in partnership with an NGO and a government agency in Mexico um, to try to apply lessons from a highly cost-effective payments for ecosystem services program in Mexico, or sorry, in Uganda, and see if they can teach, take the features from that program that helped it work so well in Uganda, see whether it might be relevant in Mexico or not, um, for improving uh, the cost effectiveness of Mexico's forest protection program. And this is a program where, where people are um, given payments conditional on uh, not deforesting trees on their land. Um, so all of these projects are still ongoing, unfortunately, because we just launched last year. Um, but I, I look forward to you know, sharing the results um, uh, with all of you and staying in touch uh, once they become available. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, um, so we have a great question that says, as an active steward of a tropical forest and regenerative agriculture and carbon farmer in Nicaragua, are there an existence of an NGO in Nicaragua, Nicaragua that performs random evaluations of poverty programs in tandem with climate action initiatives? I would like to consider partnership with j -PAL. Yes, so um, we are all the time looking for new organizations to partner with, um, and so I'm happy to connect with you um, to see if there's an opportunity to partner on an evaluation or to partner in some other way. Um, so what advice do I have for others looking to engage with communities in their research? How do you select partners and earn their trust? That's a really, really great question. Um, and it's at the heart of a lot of what we do. I think if you want to build credibility somewhere, you have to be there long term. Um, I think it, an important part of the growth of JPAL over time is that we formed um, offices in countries where we wanted to uh, work together with policymakers and researchers and NGOs closely. Um, and we have staff that are made up of 
you know, people from those countries who know um, and have built relationships with policy partners who understand what's important in that context, understand the institutions in that context. And that's been really important for us for having credibility and, and building trust with policymakers that our research is not just, you know, sitting in an ivory tower, but is actually useful um, for them and speaks to the questions that they care about. Um, okay, next question. I work at the intersection of uh, open education and climate action, where I hope we can rapidly share, apply, and refine the learnings of important experiments happening around the world. In that vein, can you talk about how JPAL achieves its scale-up goals to expand impact? This is a great question. We use many different strategies. Um, the first strategy is the most direct, which is we try to um, select research projects that are policy relevant. So it, it, it's there's real demand from the policymaker for the answering the question. And we also try to partner with policymakers who intend to use the results of the study to improve their program afterwards. Um, and uh, so that's one way where we have influence, just by working closely with our long-term partners and we do studies with them. We find out what works, what doesn't, we improve over time, and, and, and they're really the ones who scale it up. We also try to broadcast as widely as possible our, our lessons on what works on our website through media engagement, um, through uh, you know webinars like these, just to share what we've learned. Um, and, and I'd be happy to, to work with you and others to try to amplify these findings more. Um, let's see. How are these projects funded and staffed? Um, so for uh, the King Climate Action Initiative, our, our only funder at the moment and our main funder is King Philanthropies, which is a, a found, great foundation out of California. And the projects are staffed, mainly the, um, the funding is used to support data collection in the countries where the research is taking place. Um, so usually we have teams of research staff on the ground um, who are uh, conducting surveys or working with government to figure out ways to use administrative data to answer the question if we can't use survey data. Um, so that's a little bit about how it works. Um, can alum and volunteer, can alumni uh, volunteer or work to help bring expertise to these projects? Um, yeah, in some cases we have done that, and so I'd be happy to follow up with you on it um, offline. I, I don't know the best way to do that. Maybe I could just share the website. Um, is there a master board available documenting ongoing plans or wish to be funded projects? No, but that's a good idea. I think that's actually a nice idea. So yeah, we do post all of our um, funded projects online at povertyactionlab.org slash KKI. Um, and it would be cool to see if we should add the projects that we're not able to fund in case other people want to learn about them. So that's a good idea. Thank you, Claire, for that fascinating presentation. and. Thank you uh, to our audience members for submitting so many thoughtful and provocative questions. This made for a very lively and engaging conversation and we're very grateful for your participation. We appreciate your time and enthusiasm and we look forward to seeing you at future MIT events. Thanks and have a great evening.